Scream Queens. Do you play it? Do you call or do you jam? The guy will just call. Let's see if we can get this guy this time. Boom. Boom goes the dynamite. What's that from? Um. The wheel open and just obviously fold to any jam. I just we just got chips, so I might as well spew them off. Yeah, no, I think at this point, I mean, with this stack distribution, I think it does make sense to be opening a bit. Uh, we got the chips we can afford to M10, uh, and these guys we all get good leverage against. Um, this always a concern is this guy, I guess. Cube head up here. Yeah, I mean, he shouldn't really think we're going to be too light, which is part of the reason why, you know, I opened here. Um, this is only M3, we're opening on M3, M6, M6, yeah. I think we need to try and, uh, we have a chance to sort of separate ourselves from the pack a bit if we can steal the blinds and antis a few times. And that's the plan. Um, but how often are these guys jamming is the question. 14, 28, 35, 35. Yeah, we're not folding. Um, this guy's actually been probably the tighter of the bunch. So if he jams or three bets, it's pretty gross. Yeah, so I mean, these guys behind. I mean, let's say they're folding... Bring up the equal up. I mean, what sort of range are they going to be jamming? I mean, that's a kind of loose range to be jamming, I think. Say so they're jamming like this range. Eighteen percent. It's pretty loose. That might not turn us. Say seventeen percent ish. Oh wow. <laughs> oh, so sick. Yeah, he was always uh, kind of jam. I think once we min, he's gonna fall. He's gonna fall into the bait, fall for the bait, and <laughs> it's such such a sick jam because you can call with a hand that you know it flops pretty well, um, and it really looks like we have the nuts when we do that. Uh, so what was I doing? Yeah, seventeen percent. Uh, and so if we're raising, say we raise UTG now, it's four players behind. So 17% they're playing, so they're folding 83%, right? Um, 83%, five players behind. So they're folding 40%, I guess. Is that right? 13, yeah. So they're folding 40%. And we're risking twenty eight thousand when we raise. Just wait till the next hand, get the official M. That's if they are jamming the loose range. If they're jamming a loose range, let's just work out how our raises how our raises look when we open to the field. I mean yeah. 
we said 40 percent ish let's just say uh let's just say four players behind now it's folding 47 so that's definitely going to be profitable with four players behind to steal any two wow it's a big pot big pot it's actually quite quite good for us um, I'll put this thing to the test that I'm talking about. So we're raising 28 to win 28.35. It's 28 plus 35 is 63. Put that in the memory. 28, we get our raise back. So 44% it needs to work. Uh, I think we're just going to make this, how much are we going to make this? 23981 I think is fine. So it has to work. I mean, uh, it has to be worth 44% to be profitable. 44 yeah, 44% for a raise to be profitable based on the uh, amount we're risking, risk versus reward. And we said with four players behind it worked 47, which is more than that, but with five players it worked 40. And so if that jam range that we assigned the players was a little bit loose, I think, but if it was correct, it means we can raise any two with four players behind, but not with five players behind. And uh, that's presuming that post-flop, if we do get called, we're breaking even, at least breaking even and not losing money. And that's the nature of sort of, uh, you know, stealing in this spot. And that's why you see me open you know, before with the jack six or whatever and that sort of thing. and Just because it it doesn't have to work that often. <clears throat> 35, 155 divided by 35. M4.4. See what cube head does. Mr. Cube. Mr. Call. I think in this instance I will check. Uh, it's just a really bad flop, and I don't really want to bet, uh, spew off any chips. Not spew, but, you know, we see bet 30, and he raises or calls, and then, you know, every chip's kind of precious to us at the moment. And he can easily have, you know, 7, 8, 8, 9, 8, 10, 10, jack, queen, 9, king, 10s, all, all this sort of stuff. In fact, I mean, that's what he can... I mean, this is just <laughs> just the worst board ever. I don't think this this board could be any worse. Like, yeah, I mean, you couldn't actually probably make a worse board. I mean, the sure the six could be <laughs> the six could be an eight or a ten, but uh, yeah. <coughs> Of course, you know, they might widen that range up a bit if we're just relentlessly stealing. I think I will just maintain it. I think it's close with four behind. Um, I think I'll just maintain the aggression. I mean, we do have the big stack. It's our responsibility to put these guys under a bit of pressure since they're all hovering around that main sort of you know, they all have around the same stack size. Uh, and in fact, if you were to actually look at the uh, the Queen 9 hand, this is going to surprise people. Um, so what happened with that Queen 9? I'm just trying to remember. I feel like... So we had Queen 9, and we raised from the cutoff. Uh, so it's telling us actually we should be jammed, I mean, we can actually profitably jam that, you know. Um, but I don't think there's a, quite a need for that against these guys. I think uh, I'm going to play this 56. Yeah, I think I will 3-bit at 56. I think I'm going to 3-bit at quite large.
could go either way. I mean, you can call. Um, Folding is not ridiculous. I'm a little bit concerned that he's going to actually call three bets, uh, you know, quite often. Um, that's a little bit of a concern that he's actually calling three bets at, at a reasonable frequency. Because we've got a hand that doesn't play very well post flop. Um, we'd be C betting off a lot of chips. <clears throat> But I mean, so far he has been folding the th th three bets. So I mean, he certainly thought like seemed like he was thinking about a possible uh, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to fold here. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a tight fold. We could put in a little three bet, something like that. But this guy's kind of shut down a bit. You know, we haven't seen that much from him. But uh, yeah, so go make that queen nine we opened before with three players behind. We can actually just jam that. But if they're playing, I mean, if they're calling too wide, let's just say, for example, they're going to call pretty wide. No, not pretty wide, but just with hands that they shouldn't really be. Um, something like that. Let's just say, calculate. Okay, okay, you can see that now we should be whoa 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 hang on is that right so now we should be jamming quite tight because they're calling too tight i mean they're calling too loose um but yeah so uh, i mean i'm not using the exact structure and everything i'm just using a poker stars 27 get paid 180 man but i mean there was actually kind of it's actually kind of like this Because this was a 295 player, 45 get paid. So, I mean, it's not that dissimilar, if that's a word. I think it is. So, I mean... The ace nine suited before. The reason why I didn't play that hand is because we've got pretty good control of the table as it is, and it was kind of that guy hadn't been very active lately, and suddenly opens up UTG. Uh, I feel like we don't really need to put ourselves in sort of higher variance situations where we're you know risking a lot of chips. And not that three betting him against you know him there is that really risking that much, but. Just didn't fight, quite feel necessary at the, the, this time when we've got such good control over the table. And when I say control over the table, well, I think I'm going to jam this, but it's pretty close. Uh, this is kind of just doing what I just said I didn't want to do, which is put a lot of chips at risk. Um, but I just think against a cutoff open, and this guy, you know, just opened a few hands. Just seems like he's opening up a little bit. King Queen, um, just a little bit too strong. Just a little bit, uh, just up there. It's up there. <laughs> I mean, it does say that he opens a bit, um, but uh, we haven't seen him. Well, I don't know. What do you guys think? Has he been opening much? I mean, he did in the last. Passage of play a few times, the last couple of orbits, but I haven't really noticed him too much. Um, but then we've been opening so much that, and so's Cube, and Floppy's been pretty aggressive too. Earlier when he had chips, he was, so maybe he just hasn't had many opportunities to open fitness. Maybe if he gets the chance, he will open more. Uh, because I have more hands on him than just from this final table, so. Floppy is almost so short that he's annoying, you know, because he almost if we've raised we have to call off with anything, because he's M3. So, funnily enough, as I say it, he goes and busts. Well done, Floppy. I 
I think Rodman is definitely the sort of player to uh, to defend kind of wide and say, hey, Ace is up's opening a lot. So I'm going to call, or I'm going to 3-bet. Uh, this is a little bit bigger than the 3-bet he made before with the Aces, uh, so it makes me think he's a little bit weaker. Uh, and he could even be bluffing, I think, some of the time, but I'm going to give it up. It's important right now for us to go for the win. <clears throat> Well, I would have jammed if, if he didn't. It's important for us to go for the win right now because uh, we can really set it up right now with some aggression by raising and jamming on guys. We can really set ourselves up for the win and get to a point where we get all the chips and then these guys bust and a couple of guys bust against a heads up and we just have like a you know four or five to one to chip lead. Chip lead. It's important we do that and we don't uh, sort of uh, tighten up too much and just sort of hang in there and then end up going in a heads up, well, I mean, end up uh, sort of with three players left as a sh tiny stack. Um, I, I want to try and maintain the aggression here. And uh, I noticed in the 2014 WSOP that I think the, uh, the guy that played really well the first day Just gonna have to go for this one. We've been opening up so much, and we're on the button. I think even if you had a jammed, I mean, ICM probably says a fold, but uh, let's just check it. I mean, ICM's gonna say it's a fold, but I mean, <laughs> I have a really hard time folding there when we've been opening so much. Uh, but I think if we plug, if we adjust his range correctly, then. We'll probably see that it's actually uh, a call, but let's just have a really quick look before I take this break here. Uh, brain is slowing down. So we should be jamming 34%, which looks like that. Obviously we have Ace Jack, which is monster. Uh, big blind goes all in. We just raised. So, oh, we can call this check. Okay. I thought it was going to be a fold, to be honest. Ace check off. I thought it was going to look like this without the ace jack, would have been my guess. But ace jack actually can, we can call. And it does presume he's pushing with this range, which is probably. Probably fairly accurate, but I think it'd be more like that. And now Ace Jack probably is a fold. Yeah, so that's about what I would have thought it looked like. We were right on that cusp. I wasn't going to fold it though. It's right on the cusp, but I'm just not going to fold it. Um, yeah, because uh, the ICM says it's borderline, but if we win that pot, I mean, we're against these two who have, after the next level goes up in uh, two, one or two minutes it is, uh, we have a million in chips against two guys with just over 300k and both are going to be after the next level M8 and we can just raise every hand and just crush uh, and just abuse these guys. So I think that's a hidden sort of bonus that the ICM is not reflected by the ICM in ICMizer. There's a couple other tools where you can sort of play with numbers a bit, tweak things to try and account for... Uh, Increased equity based on you know skill and stack size and stuff, but not an ICM either. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean that's getting pretty hardcore. Uh, and uh, I think we uh, we went far enough with that hand. Uh, but uh, you can see that it's important to be ICM aware. And uh, so far, I think we've been playing okay and putting these guys under pressure. And we're going to continue to do that after this break. Continue on guys, four-handed action hour, <clears throat> maintaining the aggression. Uh, but we have got a bit of an image now as being pretty aggressive, so these guys might look to attack. We do have to be a little bit wary of that. Um, and a bit of uh, acting here, I think. Went to acting school for this. No, actually, I never went to acting school. I would love to have gone to acting school, but I never did. Uh, but I think it would have been a lot of fun. 
when I was in school and we had drama and I did, did that for a semester and hated it. Uh, but that's what happens when you're in school. You hate everything. Did the second language, Italian, hated that. Love to do that now. It's funny how that works. So Mr. Cube again got us. And uh, I think this is a pretty close one. But I think we're just going to have to keep going for it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be the way. It's going to go one way or the other. There's two ways this can pan out. I'm trying to think of a movie where we hear that. There's two. What's that movie? There's a. Either I'm going to something or you're going to something. I don't know. You guys can help me out in the comments. Something about there's two ways this can finish up. Either you're going to die or I'm going to die. Or you're going something or I'm... Yeah, I can't remember. My brain is literally right now... It's mush. Like it's... I imagine it as a big jelly and just... Like a marshmallow, imagine a marshmallow in a large like bowl of jelly. And that marshmallow is like the part that's actually still functioning well enough to calculate, make poker decisions. But all around it is just this just gelatin mold doing nothing kind of thing. And just that last little marshmallow part is able to calculate decisions. So that was kind of an interesting hand to see. Come on, fitness. So the button three bet, fitness jammed, and then the guy folded. I think fitness is just a little bit annoyed with us, to be honest. 227 divided by 36 here for the big blind. So we've got him 6.3. Uh, I don't think we can call if he jams, but... Twenty, thirty, forty-six. I wonder if it's we can just jam. Thirty, forty. I feel like he has a hand for some reason. For some reason, I feel like twenty, thirty, forty-six. For some reason, I feel like he might have the hand. But we have a7 suited against an aggressive player. Yeah, I guess I'm just going to jam it. Felt like he had a hand. It really did. I don't know why. I was just psychic, you know? Ah, damn. Yeah, I was going to 3-bet the fold. And then I'm like, you can't 3-bet the fold against that guy because you've been 3-betting him relentlessly, you know? I'm just feeling some sort of psychic... I should have listened to my uh, psychic feelings. Uh, 20, 30, 40... No fold equity, king 10. 20, 30, 40, 4, 12, and 4. Uh, yeah, I just felt uh, a bit sick about that one, to be honest. just sensed it. I, I don't know why. I mean, it should have been... It should have been an easy jam. We're against the guy stealing 54% on the button, uh, and we've got the ideal jamming sort of stack, and we can assert ICM pressure. I mean, it was just perfect. Um, but I just uh, felt a bit queasy about it. But uh, back on the horse. Well, not for long. <laughs> oh, what a flop. Uh, sigh, and we hit the 8. Well, there goes that that uh, that notion. But you know, I mean, we actually kind of by being aggressive in the earlier in you know from the onset, uh, we actually kind of 
Well, I mean, we actually would have uh, busted the a7 suited if we hadn't have been stealing and three betting and playing overall, I think, pretty aggressive and accumulating a lot of chips. Disappointing finish. Uh, what can we do about that a7? Um, you know, I just I had such a similar situation uh, like a month ago where I was dominating the table and had a big stack and then the second big stack raised and I just thought for some reason he might have a hand and if he does happen to wake up with a hand, all of a sudden the whole table's reversed, where the shot stack, where the desperate one, all that good effort we've put in is, is kind of wasted. Um, and that's kind of what it felt like there, but I mean, he's M10, he's raised on the button, we've got A7 suited. I actually thought, uh, for some reason I thought he was slightly shorter than M10, I thought he was M8 or 9. Uh, M10, uh, four-handed, A7 suited, I mean, it's definitely completely fine um, against the button stealer, four-handed to jam it, but especially given the ICM dynamic. But, uh, yeah, I did. I mean, he has raised into a very short stack, and also we've been three betting him a ton. I think that's kind of what made me. Maybe there was some subconscious timing tell as well. Uh, but maybe the fact that he's raised into a short stack who's jamming a bit, and the fact that we're attacking and three betting a lot, I kind of felt like. Um, yeah, I just felt like he might not be too wide opening as he normally is. And I don't know. I just didn't feel good about it, but. Yeah. I was actually initially, you probably noticed, I was going to three bet. I was actually going to three bet to fold at first. Because I thought, well, I won't jam because, uh, you know, we've got dominance over the table. We don't need to take this sort of risk. I'll just three bet. But then I thought, well, we've been three betting him a, a fair bit and we've been aggressive and opening a lot. So he's probably going to jam with like hands like Ace Deuce if he has that and maybe hands like King 10 and stuff. Uh, maybe 10 jack suited, so I'm like, well, don't really want to get jammed on by those hands and have to fold. And then it went back through my mind that, okay, well, he's aggressive, he's opening tons, uh, you know, ICM pressure, let's just jam it in, but it didn't feel good. You know, calling. Calling, and then flop, probably. Just check fold, actually, if I called. If I was... If my spidey senses were tingling, uh, oh, it's already over. That was fast. If my spidey senses are tingling, uh, I might, uh, uh, I might just call and then check fold flop. <clears throat> and they were tingling, but yeah. Um, wow, that guy just went on tear and just won like every hand. Lost that one and then won a flip. Wowza. <laughs> this, is, <coughs> this is a sick run that guy went on. Um, yeah, what did we get fourth? 843. Uh, we just came, uh, would we come in the 50 rebuy? Fifth? Something? Seven, 700 there or something as well? So... I mean, it's not too bad. We we got a couple of scores at the end, a couple of final tables. We final tabled a high-low small one earlier, but yeah, I mean, I really wanted to finish that one off and get the win. Um, I feel a bit... I feel a bit... Uh, I don't know. I mean... What can I say about it? I feel... Just disappointed, I guess. I'm just disappointed as a word, but... I feel frustrated because I don't know if I could have done anything there about the A7. I mean, I can show it to a few other pros. Um, I can show it to a few other pros and get feedback, I guess. Um, but uh, it's hard when you're looking after over a hand later without sort of knowing the table dynamics um, for people to give you accurate feedback. But I just feel like, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just felt it. Just felt you've got to trust your gut sometimes, I think. Just got to trust this uh, thing inside that uh, you know <coughs> gives you this feeling and, and speaks to you and uh, tries to guide you at certain times. And uh, I don't know. I'm getting a bit uh, getting a bit weird, guys. I don't want to freak anyone out. Um, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in again. And uh, sorry I couldn't bring home the bacon. 
Uh, but uh, I think we had uh, a lot of interesting hands and some good action uh, at the end of uh, this uh, this session, which is good because I started off as a bit of a mess when I started off. I had things going on and then tables started popping up everywhere and it took me a while to uh, sort of uh, gather my thoughts and zone in. But I feel like I played you know decent at the end and I mean we got lucky with a six earlier and won a big pot um, against. Uh, was it eights at sevens and nines? I think it was. Um, <laughs> but uh, overall, I think we. Uh, I don't feel like we really ran that good, uh, but we just got this far by, I think, just picking our spots carefully and just steadily acc accumulating chips and. Um, yeah, just couldn't quite get uh, the whole way, uh, but uh, there's always tomorrow, and I'll be back then. Guys, just uh, for the outro here, I. Uh just been thinking a bit more about the uh, a7 hand uh, and I just want to talk about it a little bit more even though I have spoken about it quite a bit and uh, what you can do in situations like that is you can type if you know the tournament number or even you know a player's name uh, can help you in your search in Windows uh, if you're on a Mac I'm not I'm sure it's something similar uh, and you just type in there and uh, bring up the file for the tournament the history which you can see here and uh, I will just highlight the hand, control C for copy, and just load history and clipboard. And uh, you can see here it's set up with everything. And the only thing you have to adjust is, of course, the pay structure, uh, which I've mentioned. And we're just using the 180 man, 27 paid, because it's, it's a fairly similar type of structure. And so if we click um, calculate in this instance, it's telling us that... Uh, after the button raises, uh, raise to 44,000. Well, that can't be right. Hang on. Let me just re think about what I've done wrong here. Hang on. What am I doing wrong here? He's raised. Oh, okay. So the raising percentage is, is, is out. That's what it is. Uh, so he was raising, uh, he was stealing 54% of hands uh, from from that position. Now we had just three bet him a couple of times. Uh, so let's just say that he's not going to be that wide. Let's just say he's going to only steal with, let's just say 30%. I mean, that I think he's definitely raising with his hands. Uh, that's probably too tight. But let's just use that range. And so you can see a7 suited is actually, you know, slightly a fold. Uh, now, if we gave him a little bit of a wider range, like uh, 40%, um, calculate. Now we can be jamming on him with a really, well, obviously almost everything. Uh, because he's just opening too wide and you just can't call, so it's profitable. But just going back to that sort of 30% range, uh, I mean, I really do think he's probably opening with, this sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, the thing is, is that the small blind short and going to jam on him if he plays the hand. And if we play the hand, we're normally well. I mean, that's not true. We do. We are going to have a flatting range, but we're going to be three betting a lot, jamming some of the time. And so he probably isn't too concerned with his hands value. I mean, he might as well steal with a lot of weaker hands as well because he's just going to get folds a lot or he's going to get jammed on. Um, but he does, I guess, want to have a little bit of equity, like a 10-jack, just in case we do flat from the big blind. I guess it's a bit of a bonus for him if he does have to see a flop to have something that with a little bit more playability. Uh, but uh, I do think he's going to be stealing. Well, I mean, normally he's 54%, so we can jam everything. Uh, not that I would, but um, just because of our tournament equity, I, I would value it a little bit too high to take sort of a risk like that. But the question really is, at this point now, uh, is is the risk here for our uh, tournament life. Uh, let, let me try and work out the best way to word, that, word this. I think with this stack size, uh, we're going to find more cost-effective pressure spots. And so I think it's better for us to be valuing our tournament stack equity or the future equity, future play, uh, a lot more compared to the equity and risk of this particular play uh, and so if he does fold it's great you know we maintain pressure we get boss status 
Uh, he's probably not going to steal as often. That's great. Uh, we pick up, you know, there's a fair bit out there already with the blinds and antis in his raise, and we move into a more powerful position. But if we're wrong, uh, we're going to have a very short stack and be virtually eliminated. And it's a little bit of a too, it's too much of a sort of a change. I mean, it's really going to cost us the tournament almost. Uh, so even if this play was slightly profitable, uh, I think when you're talking about it, you know, in a vacuum, okay, this hand it's more profitable to do to do this. But if you're thinking about your, you know, tournament equity, uh, your tournament stack equity, uh, I think it's too valuable, uh, and we have an edge over the field and the bigger stack, and we were running over the table. So for me, I'm feeling that the best play now, after looking at this hand later, is definitely to call. Uh, and uh, you can see that if he if he is jamming, I mean, if he's stealing this range, which I think is, you know, pretty reasonable, uh, fair to say that would be fairly accurate. Uh, you can see that we should it's an easy jam, and we should be jamming really wide. But having said that, I don't think the return. I really don't think the return for the play, even though if it's slightly profitable. I just still think, honestly, uh, I, I follow ICM fairly religiously, but um, I still think in this instance it's too big a risk. Uh, and so, especially with the you know this, the other stack sizes in play were so short, and just the control that we had over the table at that point in time. So even though this is probably the, uh, the jam that one who you're just following like a robot ICM, you could jam this range on him. Uh, you know, if he's raising 35%, which since he's stealing 54, I mean, even considering we three bet him a lot and the small blind was short, I don't think he's going to fold much beyond 35%. Uh, he didn't seem like the type to sort of shut down or alter his game too much, did he? He seemed like he wanted to maintain aggression. So, yeah, I mean, we could technically jam this range, but having said that, the A7 suited, I think, is best played as a flat call. Uh, if we three bet it, that's fine. I think we can, but I do think he might four bet us a little bit with a decent frequency, just because we had been three betting him a little bit, and we're not going to call. You know, we definitely can't call uh, a, a four bet shaft with a seven suited uh, again because of the ICM. So I think just because of the uh, you know the bubble factor is so high for us versus that player, it's at its highest because we're the two biggest stacks and there's two short stacks, so the bubble factor is is really uh, really high. Uh, I think I sort of was getting a bit carried away at the time with running over the table and just crushing people, uh, and it was a time to refrain from doing that and sort of say, okay, what's the risk versus the reward here? Uh, yes, this play might be profitable, uh, but it is, when it does go awry, uh, it's kind of at the expense of our whole tournament, and our tournament equity will be all but gone because we'll be left with a really short stack. Uh, so I just wanted to bring you uh, that sort of uh, information, guys, because it's important to do this sort of thing after sort of take a look at your play later, do a bit of review. I did speak to, you know, some online uh, pros, well, live and online pros. I spoke to a bunch of people. Uh, some people like the jam, uh, but the general consensus, I think, was that uh, although the jam is fine, probably, uh, you know, uh, three betting to fold or flat, flat calling. Uh, I don't really like the three betting to fold because of the dynamic too much, but uh, I do uh, really like the flat call. So if I had to play this hand again, I would just flat call, and like I said at the time, and then just probably check fold flop. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a mistake. It's not a costly mistake in sense of it being, you know, a, a mistake, mistake, but it is a little bit costly in terms of, I think we could have made a better decision, a more profitable decision, although this might be profitable. Uh, I think we could have made a more profitable decision. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, important to to now that we know this and for me to now be thinking about this, for me to make sure I don't make the same sort of mistakes again. Uh, I might even uh, write this on a sticky note and uh, and just, uh, you know, stick it on my uh, the bottom of my, uh, uh, on the bottom of my screen or I might even, sometimes what I do is actually put a little, uh, print it out and put it up on the wall. <laughs> so... It's just ingrained in there because one thing you don't want to do is make a, what you consider to be a mistake or not the best play and then, you know, go out and do the same thing again next time. You've got to make sure you, uh, you know, I allow myself, you know, who can play perfect? No one can. 
you, this sort of thing is going to happen. The important thing is, is that once it happens, you spend a little bit of time thinking about it, review it, work out how you would like to play it if you were in the situation again, and then don't forget it. Implement it. And uh, that's what I plan to do. And uh, for now, guys, that's all.